Hi, fifth graders. I just got to read some of your noticing poems, and I really enjoyed them. Uh, so I can't wait to see the color poems. Today, our subject is images and dreams. So when I say image, what do you think of? Image. Usually, I write the word on the board. Uh, I-M-A-G-E. And when you look at the word, I ask, you know, if you see a similarity to another word. Does it remind you of any other word? And usually, someone says, well, if you add I and N, you get imagine. So, image is contained in imagine. And when you imagine something, when you really imagine it vividly, you can see it. Uh, you have an image. And sometimes you can also smell it. You can hear it. You can taste it. You can feel it. So, an image is like a picture in your mind, but I'd say the strongest images are more than a picture. They're more than visual. Uh, they engage all the senses. So when you write a poem, it's great if the words that you're using help whoever reads the poem really see, hear, smell, taste, and feel the specific things you're talking about. If you write a poem about eating a banana split, you want to convey what it's like for the hot chocolate sauce to drip down the cold vanilla ice cream. And what it's like when the spoon slides into your mouth, that explosion of sweetness. You want to involve all the senses. In the dictionary, when I looked up image, it said that it was a vivid representation. And Vivid means full of life. So one thing poets try to do is put words together in a way that creates images that comes to life. Images that come to life. So how do you do that? And last week we read a poem, a uh, sleepwalker song, and it had some really vivid images, I thought. If you still have that poem, you can look at it. It says, Cut in half by shadow, she dreams on her veranda. Green flesh, green hair, with eyes of frozen silver. I don't know if you've seen that, like a person sort of cut in half by shadow, where one part is in the light and one part is shadowed. It's a very visual image. Uh, green flesh, green hair, also very visual but frozen eyes of frozen silver frozen almost makes you shiver it's got a, a feeling attached to it another image in that poem the fig tree rubs the wind with sandpaper branches and that idea of a tree rubbing the wind it's an odd way to think about it but it's something you can picture and sandpaper, if you've ever run your fingers along a piece of sandpaper, that rough, gritty feeling, um, it engages your senses. Plus sandpaper and branches, it's two words put together that don't normally go together. And a, and a poet often does that. They create unusual combination of words. And another place in the poem that says, the mountain that sneaky cat. Uh, and that's a kind of metaphor um, where the mountain is compared to a cat and you get the feeling that it's ready to pounce. So I think you've probably already heard that term metaphor in your classes. Um, sometimes A metaphor is a kind of comparison. Sometimes you say one thing is another. Sometimes you say one thing is like another. And a metaphor can take something that's familiar and show you how it's actually kind of strange 
or sometimes a metaphor can take something that seems strange and show you how uh, it's actually familiar. Metaphors have a lot of power. Um, I can say the classroom is a prison. Or I can say the classroom is a garden. And each metaphor gives you a completely different way of looking at the classroom. And there are only five words. So when you can convey a complicated idea in just a few simple words, that's power, which is why so many poets really love metaphors. So four things bring an image to life in this little explanation I've just been giving. You know, one is details that appeal to the senses. One is action. One is fresh language, unexpected combinations of words. And one is interesting comparisons, metaphors, and similes. So I want to read a few poems that I think present vivid images. And the first one's called Sun. So if you write a poem, uh, if you write a, like a, a, an essay, you have to write a report about the sun. You know, you might tell the reader how many miles from the earth it is, or what temperature it is, or when it was formed. But if you're writing a poem about the sun, you're trying to get your reader, your audience, to think about the sun in a new way. So here's sun. The sun is a leaping fire, too hot to go near. But it will still lie down in warm yellow squares on the floor, like a flat quilt where the cat can curl and purr. I'm going to read it again because it's really short. The sun is a leaping fire, too hot to go near, but it will still lie down in warm yellow squares on the floor, like a flat quilt where the cat can curl and purr. So this poem has action in it. It's got uh, this image of the warm yellow squares. You can both see that and kind of feel that. Um, I don't know if you, any of you have a cat, but if there is this portion of sunlight, cats will usually go into it. So it's nicely observed. And flat quilt is a simile. Uh, so the poem does a lot of work with just a few words to create some images that make you think about the poem or think about the sun in a different way. Now, here's a poem called Lunchbox. Also short and simple. They always end up fighting the soft square sandwich, the round, heavy apple. Lunchbox. So again, there's this image of inside the lunchbox, there's the soft sandwich and the hard apple and the, the apple rolls onto the sandwich and, you know, you open up your lunch, take out your sandwich and it's mashed up. Uh, it's an image that you can picture that uses action and vivid language. Um, so that's what uh, poets try to do, is make you think about something in a slightly different way by creating images that, that you can see or feel, taste, smell, touch. Um, here's a more complicated poem, longer. Uh, it's called Paper Boats. The writer started writing poems at a very young age and eventually won the Nobel Prize for, for literature. Uh, and he grew up, uh, I think, in what is now Pakistan. And uh, he um, didn't think he was going to become very famous when he started out. So, paper boats, and there's a few words in here you might not know. Uh, shiuli flowers. I don't really know what a shiuli flower looks like, but you find out in the poem that they bloom at dawn. 
a lot of flowers, they close up at night, and then in the morning when the sun comes up, they open up shiuli flowers. Cargo, you know, your cargo is what you're carrying, and in the, in the poem, the ships have a cargo. So it says, day by day, I float my paper boats one by one down the running stream. In big black letters, I write my name on them and the name of the village where I live. I hope that someone in some strange land will find them and know who I am. I load my little boats with shiuli flowers from our garden and hope that these blooms of dawn will be carried safely to land in the night. I launch my paper boats and look up into the sky and see the little clouds setting their white bulging sails. I wish I knew who sent the clouds to race my boats. When night comes, I bury my face in my arms and dream that my paper boats float on and on under the midnight stars. The genies of sleep are sailing in them, and the cargo is a basket full of dreams. So if we had the poem in front of us, I'd ask you to look for the images in the poems, and maybe you do have the poems in front of you. If you go through, you'll see there's quite a few of them. I picture this boy kind of sleeping like this, and in his dream, there's this image of these boats sailing under the stars. Uh, that's a really nice image. And there's a really nice image of him putting his boats into the little stream and looking at the clouds overhead floating by and wondering who sends the clouds floating by while he sends his boats floating out. Um, and I like that this poem connects images with dreams because dreams are all about images. And often when I wake up, I can't remember most of the dream, but sometimes I'll have some sort of image that sticks in my mind. And I'm going to ask you to write about dreams today. They can be dreams you've really had or, or dreams you just make up for the poem. But I want to read a few poems about dreams first. They're both by Langston Hughes, uh, a pretty incredible poet who lived in Harlem in the 20th century. And these are both about dreams. The first one is just called Dreams. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field, frozen with snow. So there's two metaphors in the poem, two images. If dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. And if you lose your dreams, when dreams go, life is a barren field, frozen with snow. It's a nice poem about the importance of dreams. And here's the last one I'll read today. It's called Dream Variation. To fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till the white day is done, then rest at cool evening beneath a tall tree, while night comes on gently, dark like me, that is my dream. To, flings my, to fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance, whirl, whirl, till the quick day is done, rest at pale evening, a tall slim tree, Night coming tenderly, black like me. Langston Hughes, 
He has a lot of really good poems. Um, he makes the action really easy to picture. This person kind of dancing as the sun is setting uh, and evening is coming on and feeling free and relaxed and at home. Um, so your assignment is to try to write a poem or multiple poems uh, using dreams and images. Try to put some images in your poem that someone who reads the poem can really picture. They can, they can see it. Maybe they can feel it, hear it. So try to use details that appeal to the senses. And the other part of it is to practice hand-mind coordination. You know, anything can happen in a dream. Dreams don't often make sense. So if you're writing about a dream, you can really write about almost anything. Um, so use your imagination to discover some images. And I really look forward to seeing what you come up with.